Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek and Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek. Um, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Holacek. Good, good to have you. I finally have a new computer. I, all the problems we've been having uh, on account of my stuff here. Uh, so I do have a new computer, it has a new camera and all that. So hopefully things are going to be a lot smoother. We'll see yes, you look 10 years younger now. <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Oh, okay. Uh, um, given, given tomorrow's my birthday and I am going to be pretty old. Anyways, how old? Let's 40? Go. Enough. Oh, oh yeah. okay. 40 times, 40 times four, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> All right, I got to get up. Uh, the so today's, oh, right. today's episode is Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, query 11. Um, but before we get started, we must, it's its a must, we must review your credentials. So everyone, anyone that is using this as a reference in a paper that they may be writing, or um, at least now they can use this video they can um, use it in footnotes for, for history, a history paper. Um, Dr. Holacek is a retired professor of philosophy and history who taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, um, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, mm -hmm. Camden, and Ohio University. Hi, Jeffy. <laughs> I, I didn't even ask him. Just oh, he knows, hears, man. He's worse than I. He knows when there's a camera. It's my voice. He hears my voice and it just oh, attracts. Oh, yeah. That's probably true. Yeah. Um, Dr. Holacek is also the editor of Journal of Thomas Jefferson and His Time and the author and editor of over um, 23 books um, on Thomas Jefferson and close to 155 essays. And the list of books and the locations of his essays can be found in the description of the video. With our show One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson's. And today we're going, we have a unique topic. I, I feel it's a unique topic, um, unlike what we've done in the past, but it does piggyback on things we have done in the past. So Piggy, um, piggybacking is always kind of good, isn't it? Yes, I, I like piggybacking because then um, it's like one long class. <laughs> Um, that builds on the next. There's, and, there's, con there's continuity. We, we, yes. That way we kind of go all over the place, but there's a sort of continuity and a logic to it. That's, yeah, yeah. And I like that too, especially for people doing research. I think this helps. Yeah. Um, and if they can go back. logic to life, right? Continuity yeah. <laughs> to life. Uh, what is life without logic? Um, so to introduce you to the topic we're discussing I today. I won't comment on that because... I think about 99% of the people on this planet don't even know how to spell the word, let alone use it. Yeah, <laughs> there's a J in there somewhere. No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, since uh, we broached the topic of Native Americans and our discussion of Jefferson's instructional letter to Captain Meriwether Lewis, we decided to turn to the discussion of Jefferson's views on Native Americans. And so Dr. Holacek directed me to query 11 of Thomas Jefferson's notes on Virginia. Here we're going to discuss not the nature of American indigens, um, but Jefferson's interest in Native American burial grounds and their origins. Um, so you never know what we're going to do from one week to the next. Uh, <laughs> that is true. Yeah, I, I, yeah, when I was reading it, I'm thinking, wow, he's there's a lot of talk on on this topic. So um, in his in his query eleven, so I can't wait to for you to answer my questions. Um, okay. Okay. So let's begin with um, question number one. Um, the Native American barrows, um, which are burial grounds. What is Thomas Jefferson's interest in the barrows? It was, um, I found it a little strange how much he spoke of them in, in this query. And what I'm going to do is um, I have a picture. You going down, Jeff? You, uh, you want to stay up here? Of the, that's that's uh, an illustration of just a couple burial grounds. And, and strangely enough, that's sort of the height and width of the burial ground that Jefferson investigates. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So you yeah. asked me what was what? 
what was his interest in this? He spoke, he spent a lot of time uh, he, he was, in very was detail. Interested in Native Americans. He was massively interested in the Native Americans for a multiplicity of reasons. I won't be able to answer all that today. We'll talk about Native Americans on some other occasion. Um, but he's talking about in query, in query 11, he's just, you know, talking about the Aborigines to give, you know, his uh, Marbois, the person to whom he's sending his, these queries, some indication of Native Americans in the state of Virginia and around the state of Virginia. Then he goes off, as he customarily does in his notes, he goes off to certain topics that are of interest to him. And here he's waxing scientifically. He starts talking about these Native American pharaohs, and he says there is a, a burial ground, as you see in the picture, and says there's one near him. There are different sizes, and you know, he mentions one near him. And he wants to know, he wants to test out, and, and this is, I think, rather fascinating because he's, he's an empirical philosopher in the same vein as Francis Bacon mm -hmm. and uh, Isaac Newton, John Locke. He wants to put, there are several hypotheses that have been put forth concerning what these burial grounds are, what's, how the bones are buried in them, and what their purpose was. And Jefferson wants to test certain hypotheses, and he has three in mind. The first, uh, you know, maybe called the fallen warrior bow, uh, hypothesis. And he says, some have thought that they uh, are covered, they covered the bones of those who had fallen battles fought on the spot of interment. So where you see the pictures there, there was a battle and where the warriors fell down, they you know, collected the bones and just covered the warriors with dirt in honor of the, the battle. A second hypothesis might be called the uh, periodic collection hypothesis. He says some ascribe them to the customs said to prevail among the Indians of collecting at certain periods the bones of all their dead wheresoever deposited at the time of death, put them in a pile, covering them up with, with dirt. Others, you know, which I call the sepulcher, the urban sepulcher hypothesis, is that these burial grounds. Um, they were sepulchers for towns. Um, when the first person in an Indian village or town died, they would sort of stand him up and put dirt around him. And then the next person died, they would rest him against that, put dirt around him. So they oh. contain, you know, so there's a sort of logic to how these, these uh, people are put into the ground and, and, and died uh, when they died. So, um, that might be called the, you know, the urban sepulcher hypothesis. Again, they okay. one dies, you stay, stand them up, put dirt around them, and next leans against him, and it's sort of like a monument to these little villages that, where people died in the order that they died, and so forth. So he wants to test between. Them. So he's uh -huh. using. Uh, quickly, he's using something that we call, uh, we call today hypothetical deductive reasoning. You have an hypothesis, you deduce a consequence, you test if you get uh, evidence uh, consistent with the prediction. It, you say, you know, in, in modern language and philosophy of science, you say we have confirmed that hypothesis. If we find something inconsistent with it, um, we uh, disconfirm the hypothesis. And disconfirmation is generally in philosophy of science a matter of throwing it out completely, though, though not always. It's a little more complicated. Okay. In other words, if I say all swans are white, right, that means that the next swan I see should be white. If it is white, that gives me more reason to think that the hypothesis is true than when I started. You know, and the more I see that are white without finding one that's not white, the more evidence I have, right? Right. If I come across one that's not white, I throw it out, you know, all high, all swans are white, it's just false. Right. Okay, so that's the the, the, huh. the sort of reasoning, simple reasoning he's using, but it's rather sophisticated stuff. Okay. Question number two. So we have three hypotheses, and Thomas Jefferson, it goes without saying, wants to know which, if any, of these hypotheses is true. Yeah, um, he so he goes in and it would something that would be an act of great desecration. But these burial grounds at his day, you know, 
they were the one near him is being farmed. So mm -hmm. it's not as tall as it used to be. There were trees on it at one point he mentions. And so he digs into it. He wants to test these hypotheses. So, you know, he says, and I'll read from his book, when he digs into um, from six inches to three feet below the surface, he says, these bones were lying in utmost confusion, some vertical, some oblique, some horizontal, and directed to every point of the compass, entangled and held together in clusters by the earth. Bones of the most distant parts were found together, as for instance, the small bones of the foot in the hollow of the skull. Many skulls would sometimes be in contact, lying on the face, on the side, on the back, top or bottom, so as on the whole to give the idea of bones emptied promiscuously from a bag or basket uh -huh. and covered over with earth without any attention to order. Notice he says, thrown in from a bag or basket. Uh -huh. Right off the bat, that tells us we can get rid of which hypothesis, right? Yeah. Um, remember the sepulcher hypothesis tells us that the bones were put in it there's a definite order to them. First person dies, stands up, next person yeah, no, gets person. covered. But these the bones are scattered all over. So he says we have reason to reject that. Then he goes on to say um, later, goes on, he says, uh, he's talking about finding the bones of infants. He says this last furnishing the most decisive proof of the burial of children here. I was particular in my attention to it. It was part of the right half of the underjaw. And he goes on to say, so, you know, he notices the bones of children. And if you look at the hypotheses, this tells against this, this confirms which one, you know, the, the warrior hypothesis, unless children are warriors, we can rule out. So we, we've got two done, right? We, uh -huh. we can rule out the, uh, the fallen warrior hypothesis and the urban sepulcher hypothesis. So we're left with the periodic Got a collection hypothesis. hypothesis that they just were sort of dumped in there, right? That's what we're left with. Okay, okay. Well, that makes that makes sense. Um, okay, so we have three hypotheses and two are ruled out, as you say, um, disconfirmed. So hypothesis number two, um, left standing must be true? No. Um, Consider when we deal with hypothetical deductive reasoning, I'm, I'm collecting, it's a perfectly good argument. But um, imagine if I notice, if I say, what's that game clue? You have Colonel Mustard or some professor, I don't know, Plum Mustard. Somewhere. Let's just say A, B, and C. I have, mm -hmm. I've been around the game clue. A, B, and C are thought there's a murder. And... Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks, well, it's either A, B, or C. They're the most logical. We rule out A couldn't have done it. Then we find out B couldn't have done it. So we say C did it. Mm -hmm. Does that follow? Yeah. No, it, it follows only if A, B, or C did it. If okay. we know, definitely, the, no one else except those three could have done it. But unless we're in a position to know that, we can't, by eliminating to two, say that. Say Notice Jefferson does that when he talks about religion and reason. He says what, what reason enables us to do is to, if there's a true religion, we can find it by weeding out the false ones. But mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily expose the true religion if you weed out the false ones. It's just one, in effect, is left standing. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you really want confirmatory evidence that the other one, and he looks for that, right? He, he goes and he, he's, uh, he, he makes a perpendicular cut in in the uh, uh the barrel and he digs in and he's looking for all sorts of evidence and uh without reading the whole thing he says uh he says the following are particular circumstances that give it this aspect he's, he's arguing that the periodic collection hypothesis is true the number of bones their lots their confused position which is consistent with two they're being in different strata they're different layers suggesting that there are different times bones were dumped in. Uh, the strata in one part having no correspondence with those in another. The different states of decay in these strata would seem to indicate a difference in the time of inhumation and the existence of infant bones among them. Those three things he thinks um, militate for 
the periodic collection hypothesis that they were just don't and militate against. I don't know what that means either, but I'm saying militate against the uh, hypotheses one and two, the fallen warrior in the urban sepulcher hypothesis, right? That they were put up ordered and so forth. So he, um, again, he's not in a position to know categorically that the second one, but we have a lot of evidence that points in that direction. So he's pretty happy with the conclusion that, uh, that you know, this is just a, a sort of random burial spot for all sorts of Native Americans who happen to have died. That's what these barrels are. Yeah, could he have just asked one of the chiefs? I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I guess he could have, he didn't, but um, good question. I mean, that might have just been simple. One of the uh, uh, natives uh -huh. around him, that'd be the easiest way to tell, but um, Jefferson has to get his hands dirty with this. Yeah. Why do you have to ask a question like that? Because that cuts, the, everything I said just, you know, you don't need to have said it. Um, but anyway, I mean, yeah, he could have, I guess. Well, and, well and, I'm just, I'm thinking of all of this thought that he put into it. And, well, and I, I do you know, he, and it, well, yeah, it's a good question. And it tells you something about Thomas Jefferson, doesn't it? Yeah. He's, well, that's, gotta, he's got to play. It's playtime for Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's easy enough just to do that. And, but look, if someone tells me this is what's going on, do I know that for sure? The right. best way to know is to get your hands dirty. Right. Or maybe when he's talked to different people, he's got different, perhaps right. there are different. That's how they came up with these hypotheses in the first True. place. Perhaps. True. So, maybe each tribe did it differently. Could be. So it, in effect, he doesn't say this, but he's only in a position to say that this burial ground is consistent with two. And it, it's it's a good question to ask. It could be that uh, in different burials, they did things differently. Um it's just but, like a highly intelligent person to overcomplicate something simple. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You know, remember what I just said, and I believe this. It was fun for Jefferson. Yeah. He's got, he's got to have, he's like a little boy. He's got to have his playtime. All right, let's go and dig in here. You know, someone say, well, you know, they wouldn't have talked about it being desecration, but the Native Americans would have felt that way. But it's, uh, uh, He's got to have his playtime. That's all. So it's the only thing I can say about it. Yeah, yeah. And this definitely is. Um, okay, question number four. Um, Thomas Jefferson then asked, whence came those Aboriginal inhabitants of America? He refers to Captain Cook's disclosure in 1778 that Asia and North America are separated only by a narrow strait. So is it it is reasonable to assume the passage from inhabitants of one continent to another? and the converse. That takes us to more hypotheses. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, he was, um, we'll have to talk at some further time about Native American languages, but here we're sort of elliptically talking about Native American languages. Uh, Captain Cook, you know, uh, you mentioned you gave a date, did you not? 1778, 78. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are other people that went over what's today called the Bering Strait. And right. the, the, you know, the possibility of there having been at one time just a land bridge, uh -huh. right? Um, geographers would talk about that, people speculating about the origins of people. And so Jefferson, and there's a lot of talk in Jefferson notice physical, as well as other people, you notice rather physical similarities between Native Americans and the um, the Asians, the Far Eastern Asians, the Russian Asians over mm -hmm. there. And from the simil physical similarities, there is, you know, discussion if there was a common origin, if mm -hmm. possibly... Native Americans might have gone over the strait, or if there were a land bridge at some point, might have just migrated into, into Asia, into uh -huh. Far Eastern Asia, and then populated that. Or conversely, whether the Far Eastern Asians came into America and populated that. So he All wants right. to answer that question. And it's a, you know, it's a, uh, very interesting question, is it not? It is. It is because we never think of it going both 
ways we always think of it going one way. Well, it's going to go one way or the other, uh, more mm -hmm. than likely. I mean, it doesn't have to. One could imagine that if both sides were people, but, you know, talking about early right. enough, one side's people, the other's not. And um, Jefferson tries to answer the question. The best way he thinks he can answer that question is by, Jeffy's just passed out on my lap right now. Aww. He's such a hot dog. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, and the best way to answer the question is examination of languages. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Now, now Jefferson is looking, and Jefferson collected Native American dialects. Mm -hmm. He gives an argument that's really intriguingly interesting, intriguingly fascinating to me. He says, look, there are so many different dialects of, of Native American tongues in not only different dialects, you find dialects that are so different that when Native Americans are interacting, they need interpreters. That the, 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 the languages have changed so much over time on assumption that there was, you know, a few certain early Native Americans and then they branched out and then through separation, the languages, the dialects became distinct. And he says, look, there are so many different Native American dialects. And he compares them to the dialects of the Eastern Asians. Right. And he finds them to be fewer. Wow. So that would argue if we have many more dialects in North America, fewer in Eastern Asia. Wow. And many more varieties of the dialects in North America. That's an argument and a rather interesting argument for the, the Native Americans being older mm -hmm. and having migrated over the Bering Strait and populated Asia. Pretty good argument, right? Right, right. The only problem with that is we know that the opposite happened. Most of the researchers today actually did. Now, on the barrels, I didn't do any research on that, but I should. By the way, I am going to write a book on Jefferson Native Americans, and I'm going to talk about all this stuff there. Because I okay. told you last time, Wallace's book is so anti-Thomas Jefferson. And I started writing the book already. Uh, I'll, I'll put it on the back burner until I finish my Yuki book. Okay. Uh, I want people to have, not saying my work is perfect or anything, but I want people to have uh, a nuanced and clean and honest view. Right. Jefferson was no angel when it came to Native Americans, and we're, we'll test, discuss that at some point. But just to start off from having someone who's uh, an anthropologist who knows very little about Jefferson starts off by reading three or four sources. And, you know, those sources are all bad sources for Ron Brody, uh, Levy, and other people who find who have nothing nice to say about drawing exclusively from four or five sources that are anti Thomas Jefferson, concluding Jefferson was an asshole, and then from that write your book. Right. How do you do that? Right. You, can, you right. can't have a view, especially someone who doesn't know Jefferson, have a view where you don't know a lot about Thomas Jefferson, and then you 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 start from a biased perspective, and then the, the whole book is tarnished by that. Mm -hmm. As an anthropologist, he should, um, Eric Erickson, for example, was a psychotherapist uh, in, from the early disciple of Freud in some sense, went on to do his own thing. Very brilliant man. And he wrote a book on Jefferson. He psychoanalyzed Thomas Jefferson. I, I talk about him in my book, Thomas Jefferson's Psychobiography of American Line. Erickson was a brilliant psychotherapist didn't know a lot about Jefferson. But he mentions that in his work. He says, yeah, you know, I, you know, I can say these things about Thomas Jefferson, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not really, I, I haven't thoroughly examined his stuff. So we need to take everything I say with a grain of salt. And that's what wow. Wallace should have done. Wallace didn't do that. So I want to try to give listeners or readers uh, a more balanced view. The I bad things Jefferson said about natives, the good things he said, and overall, what was his position? So right, and context is so important. Um, oh, as, absolutely, as when we're looking at history, um, because you can, it, I think, so many things are taken out of context, and and we have to realize the conditions um, of society at the time, and and what was happening, 
and the information or lack of information they had access to. Um, so, yeah, well, you know, we, we were a civilized culture, but maybe not as civilized as we are today, emotionally civilized. Yeah, you mentioned context that he, uh, he takes a quote from Margaret Baird Smith. I don't know, I sent you something in the email. I don't know if you read it, but it was a sort of a, a book review on, you know, just on the intro. And he takes a quote from uh, Margaret Baird Smith to the effect where Thomas Jefferson says, and Baird Smith writes of this when she visited Jefferson. He goes, oh, how I wish I had the power of a tyrant. And we don't know if Jefferson said that. But our Margaret Baird Smith, who's pretty reliable, said Jefferson said it. He puts that in his book. So he says Jefferson had a lust for power. He said, I got this quote, how I wish I had the power of a tyrant. All right. I go back and I got Margaret Baird Smith's book and I'm reading it. And Jefferson, she says, Jefferson says that, but he says it, you talk about context. He says that within the context of people cutting down trees around Washington. Jefferson is a tree hugger. He loved trees. Mm. And he's noticing and he's discussing all these people taking down these beautiful old trees. And he's angry about it. He says, I wish I had the power of the tyrant because I would keep people from cutting down these lovely trees. So right. that makes him a real brutal son of a bitch, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But isn't that, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry to say this, Donna, but that's what makes my blood boil me, about yeah, people me too. writing on <laughs> Jefferson. It's lack of honesty. You take mm -hmm. something out to make him look like a son of a bitch. When you go back and read what he really said in the context, he actually turns out to be, wow. What a great guy. He's a tree hugger. I'm a tree hugger. I love trees. Yeah. I, I, you know, I do chop a few down around my place, but I always grow some new ones. Uh -huh. So um, Jefferson was a tree hugger. What? He's a tyrant because he wanted to save trees. That bastard. <laughs> How dare he? <laughs> How dare he? Oh, a gosh. Mean, mean God. What kind, of, what kind of man does that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you get the whole picture you get at Monticello and often at Poplar Forest is consistent with this past. He was a racist. He was a rapist. He was a hypocrite. Everybody writing a, no uh, a novel or, I mean, a biography of Jefferson starts off with this hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, if you read him carefully, take him at his word. There's no reason you, you have to read hypocrisy into and, and you can get hy hypocrisy out of an, an interpretation of Jefferson if you're, as you often mention, if you're using uh, the fallacy of historical anachronism, I call it, you're using present day mores and values to judge past figures, which is just not right. Oh, so we, we have to start question number five. Gosh, I could talk about this all night. Um, Isn't that good stuff? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, question number five. Finally, you've said nothing about Thomas Jefferson on the nature of Native Americans. Why are we talking about barrows and origins and not their nature? Well, for one, we don't have time to do all of that in one. And mm -hmm. uh, I planned initially to talk about, we can do something about what Jefferson thought about the nature of Native Americans. And his views were different from those of Blacks. Um, we'll do that on another occasion, I thought. So I okay. just thought it'd be better to focus on Jefferson as a philosopher of scientists and as a practicing scientist, something that historians don't talk about at all because they don't have, it. you know, I, I was in the world's foremost history and philosophy of science department at the University of Pittsburgh, best in the world. So, you know, I had a class, classes on Galileo and Newton, Ptolemy, Copernicus and all these people. And, you know, these were people that Jefferson read and loved to read. And, uh, um, you know, Bacon, and uh, he studied these people, he read these people, and, uh, you know, you have to know that stuff as well. That's right. why. I'm not neglecting anything. I'm just trying to do something a little bit different. You know, if it were up to you, we'd be talking about Jefferson's political views all the time. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like, I'm most interested in in the development of our country and how it all, how the great minds came together and created what we have today, you know, um, or I, the foundation for what we have today. But let me throw this at you. To understand Jefferson's political views without understanding the, the, the breadth and right. depth of his mind 
you, you're just not going to, if you study his political thinking, you're not going to understand his appreciation for liberalism, freedom of the press, and all that stuff, because this guy was doing every fucking thing a person could do to advance human affairs. So you got to know the person. You can't right. just, you know, writing a biography of Thomas Jefferson without knowing Plato and Aristotle. And I'm working on uh, my Ukrainian books, uh, the Stalin, Stalin, um, Stalin and the Ukraine from 1928 to 1933. I'm reading Stalin's letters. I'm reading um, Lenin's works. Some of the stuff Lenin wrote. I'm, I'm reading also. I'm reading uh, Leon Trotsky's autobiography right now. Now, is that really relevant to the book I'm writing? Not too much, but you know, you need to soak up the entirety of the milieu right. to understand what was going on. Right. It's a daunting task, but it's it's that's the way you do it. You know, I it's I I I really I do uh, truly agree with you because his political views were only a small part of who he was, but it comes from all of these other great things that he was interested in that inspire him to want freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and all the things he fought for um, that he wanted to give us come from his love of all of these other things and, yeah. and his and his freedom to explore these things and wanting everyone else to have that same freedom and luxury of an education. Um, right. And I truly believe, you know, I, I just have I had this feeling, I know I asked you once and, um, and I know this isn't the case, but I just feel like he is the the center of classical education. Um, that he was an ins an inspiring component of of what today's classical education is. It's everything Thomas Jefferson studied. <laughs> he was, uh, you know, we talked. I railed uh, against uh, Gordon Wood in his chapter on Jefferson. Um, which is fairly pejorative, I thought. Jefferson was the Enlightenment in America. I'm making that strong claim. He was. There was no greater figure in that time of the Enlightenment ideals of progressivism, of liberalism, of freedom, uh, than Thomas Jefferson. Not Benjamin Franklin, certainly right. not John Adams or any of the Hamiltonians and things like that. It was Thomas Jefferson, not James Madison. James Madison was too much of a practicalist. Mm. So that was the greatness. If you want to talk about someone asked me when I was interviewed, was Jefferson great? Absolutely. He mm. was great because he was a visionary. He had, as you're talking about, he had such a great education. You know, if you want to hold it against Gordon Wood that seemed to want to do that, hold it against Jefferson because he had too much education. No. Jefferson put his education to great service. It made him an extraordinarily well-rounded person. He was America's enlightenment. He brought Palladian architecture, the classicism, back to America single-handedly. All those, we'll talk about architecture sometime, but all those darn buildings you see at schools and government buildings, right? Uh -huh. With the, the colonnades and the Ionian, the Doric, uh, and Corinthian, right? styles uh the italianate not italian but i mean with italian styles as well it's all thomas jefferson he was the mm -hmm. first to do it brought it to america mm -hmm. so i mean what a remarkable person yeah yeah I, I'm, really, he really i'm just blown away it's just that people ask well you can you know is it arrogance that i'm writing so many books on jefferson is the matter i just want to write a lot of books and say yeah no one in the world has written so many books like i have uh, that's probably a little bit of that, but you know what? The guy was so broad-minded and so deep, and I'm a broad-minded person. Yeah. I've studied seven languages, and he loved language. He loved There's so much to write about because he, he had his hands in so many things that um, people yeah. do one book and then they move away from him. So, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good today, huh? So we got a different side of Jefferson. For yes, us. we did. Oh, hold on, I want to put the um, I want to put this back up because we're running out of time, and I want people okay. to know how to contact. And I want you. and I want people to like uh, the video while you're watching it on yes. YouTube. Please, Please like it and share it with other people so we can get more views. There'll be more of this, 
And maybe we can get, you know, Jennifer Aniston. Is that how her last name goes? Oh, I watched a movie she did. I don't remember what year it was, but I had never heard of it. It's called Cake. Um, I watched a movie and she was phenomenal. It was it was such a serious yeah. movie and she was in, she is such an incredible actress. Um her the way she played this character and it, she made it so real and she really did a fantastic job so she is out that would be great to have her on our show <laughs> I'm, I'm just interested in the bod Oops, figures me. i didn't say that how talk about time. how narrow i am uh, yeah she's pretty easy on the eyes but and All she's right, a, for, she, and she's a fantastic she's very talented very a fantastic act actress you, you can uh, speak more to that than i can all right, teaser for next week because I, I don't watch, I watch some oh, movies. Oh, wait, that's an old slide. Um, yes, what is the teaser for next week? Um, Valentine's Day is coming up soon, right? It's the 14th. Yes. Yes. So next week will be the 12th. We Bunga, are going Bunga, to, yes. <laughs> we are going to give you, everyone, pay attention. You're going to get a Valentine's Day sandwich. In my estimation, the greatest letter Jefferson ever wrote. I think it's... Uh, uh, a love letter, his billet doux to Maria Cosway, a woman after his wife died with whom he fell in love. He writes this love letter, which is God ungodly long, and he pours his soul out. We'll go into details on wow. that letter. So it's a love letter to Maria Cosway. We'll talk about, I have a book on that uh, that's not published yet, but it's done. I just sent it out to publishers early in the week. Wow. And, uh, so I'm excited because I, you know, we could talk about, you know, this interesting question. Did he love her more than he loved his wife? Oh, you know, you know, no one asked that question. Um, she was okay, so Okay, that's different. question number one. <laughs> I don't know if we can answer stuff. We could try, but I mean, we're going to look at the letter. So we're going to give you on the 12th a, uh, and then on the 19th, we'll talk, uh, okay. we'll dissect the letter in two shows. So we'll oh, try okay. So it's going to take two through. shows. Two shows. When, okay. Don't you think? Would that work? Okay. It's such a long letter, and I just think it's such a great, great story. I wish my book were out. Oh wow! Well, um, can people contact you uh, if they'd like? Can they uh, contact you? Well, they, can, they can email me, and, and then when the book comes out, probably okay. a year from now, we can arrange for an autograph okay. copy or whatever. I just think it's so cute because. Uh, he really was manly in love with her, like a little puppy dog. Oh. You know, you've got this brilliant mind, and he sees this talented, cute young artist who's great musically and artistically, and he just falls for her. So, oh wow, that's for so next week. We're going to talk about Jefferson 